Well, welcome back to Hungry Horse Chapel. Uh, good to have you wherever we find you this week. Uh, we had our second winter here in Hungry Horse, Montana. We got about 16 inches of snow this week, and I'm hopeful that we're done. Um, but uh, that could just be wishful thinking, right? And uh, so anyway, we're glad to have you. Uh, if you hear a little banging going on in the background, we got a little construction going on in our facility. And I figured as long as I can't use it, I might as well tear it up because I don't have to clean it up. So anyway, you bear with us if you hear a little hammering in the background. So I just let you know things are going on. So uh, we've uh, spent the last couple of weeks together looking at the concept of hope. And I, I, I really want to continue in that vein today again. Um, I, I want to bring hope out in a whole life concept right? Rather than just a narrow way of living where I maintain hope to survive. Um, last week, I contrasted hope with, with wishful thinking, or you, you could also call it optimism. And uh, optimism says, I'm looking for something good to happen. But hope says, together, we can do something good. Hope is us together. That's what hope is rooted in, founded in. It's never a me alone concept. And so my closing thoughts last week revolved around the idea um, that this concept of hope has been God's plan for you and I since the creation of the world. God coming near to us to do something good together. That's what hope is. It's, it's, it's this us together, God with me, and then me with you. Right? There's a lot of us together, but, but primary and, and of primary importance is God coming near to me to give me the hope that I need to walk with others. And so I want to jump off of that thought to consider the last aspect of my human makeup and uh, that we really haven't fully considered and, and how hope operates there. The three parts of my humanity are presented in the Bible. And they are that I have a physical body that I live in. I have a soul, like my heart, my mind, will, and emotions. Um, and, and some would, would call that like the intellect. And, and finally, uh, I have the spirit of a person, right? I live in a body, which is temporary. It's just a container uh, for something more important. I have a soul or an inner heart which is my mind and my will and my emotions, or the, the intellect or the power of reasoning, as you could call it. But I am a spirit. Now, the spirit is the part of me that is eternal. And if you look in the book of Genesis and the account of creation, you see that God breathed life, that he breathed his spirit into this mud man that he had made, and it became alive. And, and so we see that purpose, and we, we see in the book of Ecclesiastes that it says, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We go back to what we were created from, but the eternal spirit that God gave us leaves and goes someplace. Um, the spirit will spend eternity in one of two places, uh, either with God in heaven, which is hope at its zenith, Right. Um, or it will be separated from God and his presence in a place we refer to as hell, which is um, the other end of the hope spectrum, which is hopeless. And I'm persuaded that the greatest power of hope, or the us together, is found in the eternal spectrum of hope, right? There's different spectrums of hope we've looked at. There's a Physically, we feel hope, you know, in the soul, we feel hope, but this eternal spectrum of hope or how it has to do with hope is the most powerful. Uh, to live without the eternal spectrum of hope is to just exist and to live for today. <clears throat> and we know, right, how fast today can change. Like we're living in, wow, that happened overnight. How did that happen? And so God's hope or the us together meets us in our today and his promise of nearness and care no matter what the world may hold. So like, you know, hope comes to me today. However, the anchor or holding power 
of that hope reaches for and moves us towards an eternity of nearness that far exceeds anything we can comprehend as we live on an earth broken by sin and death. Listen to what Paul, uh, Paul in the New Testament, he's a New Testament apostle, listen to what he wrote to the church in Corinth in the first century. In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 19 and 20, you can find this. And this is what Paul wrote. He said, if we who are abiding, and I just want to stop there for a minute. Anytime you see the word abiding in scripture, especially in the New Testament, it's an us together term. It is a place that I have in Christ where I am near him and he is near me. And it's compared to the grafting of a branch into a vine, into a vine. I can get my tongue put back in my head today, but it's a, an abiding. So if we who are abiding, we're, we're near to God and he's near to us. If we who are abiding in Christ have hope only in this life, and that is all, then we are of all people most miserable and to be pitied. But the fact is that Christ, the Messiah, has been raised from the dead, and he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep in death. Wow. So if, if I'm operating in a hope that is just for the here and now, I'm to be pitied above all people. Why is that true? Why is that true? Why is it that my hope is just in things that can happen here that I'm, I'm to be pitied? Well, because hope, that hope, is being built on everything going good for me while I live here on earth. <laughs> Everybody say disappointment, right? Um, if, if that's my hope, is that I'm going to serve God and he's just going to make things go good for me here on earth then I'm to be pitied above all people. Number one, there's nobody that that's ever happened for, right? You're hoping for something. That, that is optimism. That is wishful thinking. Uh, when Christ comes near here on earth, it's us together moving for good. And, but that means adversity, right? There's always going to be the element of, of adversity that we face. But if my hope is based in something eternal that cannot change, then I have real hope. So I, I just want to do um, a little a little reality check, and it's and, it, and it's kind of this, I guess is what I want to get to. My hope is anchored in this, that no matter what happens today or tomorrow or next month, I have a sure hope in the eternal promises of us together that God has made to all who invite him to come near and to be their Lord and Savior. And uh, so I, I want to do just a, a little reality check right here to help bring some perspective to our current situation because perspective and context are so important to interpreting information and how it really affects us. And so I want to talk about a couple of things. Not, this sounds a little hopeless, but it's not. It's, it's perspective, and it gives perspective to eternal things as well. Um, so from January 1st up to April 3rd, approximately 57,000 people worldwide have died from the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, every one of those lives mattered. And every one of those lives has an eternal reality. And I say reality because we do. We have an eternal reality. However, every day on this planet, 150,000 people die from something. Now, from January 1st through April 3rd, same amount of time, 14,100,000 people have died. Each one matters, and each one has an eternal reality. Now, that means that out of every 1,000 deaths, four are from this pandemic. That's, that's a real deal, and it's a big deal, and everybody's looking at that. But what strikes me is that we don't consider the reality of the 996. Um, what's the point of this dismal talk? <laughs> well, most of the time, we choose to ignore the 996 things that could get us by pretending that they won't, right? 
And that's our hope, that is like, those things aren't going to get us, and that's what's wrecked hope for so many people, is all of a sudden, they see something that could touch them, and that scares them. But the reality is that 996 out of 1,000 people who die today, and then there's 150,000, so that means 600 people today will, will probably succumb to the uh, COVID-19. But 199,000 400 will die in other means. Um, the reality is that all of us one day will face death one way or another. Um, we choose to live in a mindset that we'll never die. You know, so many times I find that I just live like they're like every day is just going to keep coming. Um, but the reality is that one day all of us will face it, whether it's from COVID-19 or something else. And the current crisis is as much about people having to consider their mortality um, as it is about the virus itself. Um, the point is that there are many things that can sneak up and bite us when we don't expect it. And if we don't have hope beyond our health, our wealth, our intellect, and our friends today, then we of all people are most miserable and to be pitied. Chances are very good that COVID-19 won't get you. Four hundredths of one percent. But the chances are 100 percent that something will get you at some time. Nobody has ever gotten out of death. Hope that is stronger than death is a sure thing. Right? A hope that goes beyond this life. A hope that goes beyond my physical body. A hope that goes beyond what I hold today and goes into eternity. That hope, the hope of Jesus Christ, is stronger than death. That's a perspective that will live beyond this current situation and one that can sustain you for a lifetime here on earth. So I want to share some some eternal hope promises from the Bible, um, which is God's word to us. Um, the first one is a statement of truth with a promise, um, and it's found in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 23. And it says this. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, the truth statement is that the brokenness and death that we experience here on this earth is the direct effect of sin. Sin is at the core of any action that severs our relationship with God. It destroys the us-together reality in that relationship. And separation from God in his presence is really the reality of death. Sin takes life as payment, right? The, uh, the promise is that Jesus came to pay the price of sin so anyone who wanted to be restored to the nearness of relationship God could, to God could freely have it, both now and forever and into eternity. What hope? John 10.10 10 says this. Jesus said this in the book of John. He says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Life is never full if it's lived without the hope of eternity. Right? This hope that we have goes beyond us and it goes into eternity. That's where the promise goes. John 11. Uh, John again, the chapter, chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, now Jesus is, is speaking to a friend. He's speaking to Mary, and her brother has died, Lazarus. And Jesus is speaking to her just before Lazarus is raised back from the dead. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Right? Hope's foundational strength is found in God's promise of us together forever. Right? The life here on earth that ends with this body does not end life. 
It's just the end of a container that holds who I really am, a spirit from God. And the problem with sin is sin has separated me from that fellowship with God. And uh, that I'm offered the hope of us together again forever. And so all of this goes back to a statement that I made to a friend when he inquired about the faith and hope I have in Jesus. And it was this. This is the statement I made. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And without that hope, that us together, he daily provides, I'm a dead man. The need for the hope of eternity is really uh, a built-in part of our makeup. If you'll consider that we were created by God and, and we hold an eternal purpose in his creative plan. King Solomon wrote to this effect in the book of Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 says, He made everything beautiful in its time. He also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Um, God has placed eternity in our hearts. It's something we live for. Unfortunately, too many times we try to live it out in a physical sense where we live like the days are just going to keep coming. And, and the reality is that they're not. The reality is that we need a hope that goes beyond this life. Having the full spectrum of hope is not a complicated thing. Um, it's, it's not a long list of do's and don't do's. It's, it's as simple as receiving God's gift of forgiveness for sin. Sin is the separating force in our relationship. And this is the whole reason that Jesus came to earth. Now listen to what it says in, in the book of John again. I, I'm sticking with John today. We're, we're uh, kind of kind of my, my theme book, I guess, but very well-known passage of Scripture. John 3, 16 and 17, and it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Wow, this isn't complicated. This is just like receiving a gift. You know, uh, I said last week, I, I kind of thought God was sitting back judging me most of my life. That's why I avoided finding hope in Christ. It's like, I'll never do this good enough. But then I find out in the most basic of of scriptures that has to do with salvation and the forgiveness of sins and the nearness of God, that when he sent Jesus, he sent him to come near to me so that I could know him, not so that he could judge me. And there is a judgment side of God that some will face because they reject his nearness. And they put their arm out and they say, no, God, I don't want you near. Man, let him come near. It's, it's such hope. And so look at that. It says all who believe can be saved. What is there to believe? And that's a great question for, you know, thanks for considering that with me. Um, I'm sure somebody's asking that. And first, I guess I, I would have to believe that I have acted in ways that have separated me from God. And that is sin. That's the definition of sin. Sin has a price to be paid. And in Romans 6.23, we're told that the price is high. The wages to be paid for sin is death. Somebody has to die to pay for it. Well, God made a way. This is the next thing I got to believe. God made a way for the price to be paid for anyone who wanted their debt canceled. Like these wages were all stacked up against me. I needed this debt taken care of. I was going to have to die to pay it. God says, hey, I'm going to send my son. He's going to die in your place. He's going to pay your price so that you can come near to me again so that you can have the relationship of nearness, us together, and the hope that that provides, not only now, but into eternity. And so he sent his only son, Jesus, from heaven to die in my place, to pay my debt, and to restore me to the us-together fellowship with God that he always intended for me to have. That's the believing in a nutshell. Um, and so what does it look like practically to requisition the hope of eternity? Well, it's this. It's a simple prayer. Um, it's a simple request. What is prayer? Prayer is talking to God. <laughs> it's what it is. It's not formal. It's, 
it's not legalistic. It's, it's, just, it's just what I'm doing here. Uh, I talk to God the same way. And, and at one point, I prayed this prayer maybe a little differently, but, but it's the same thing. I just talk to God. You don't have to close your eyes. It you, doesn't matter where you're at. And, and it's this. You know, if you want that hope, Jesus, I, I need the hope that only you can give. Right? I've done some stuff, lots of stuff. And I know that it separated me from you. Would you forgive me and take away the weight of death from my life and replace it with the hope of us together, both today and on into eternity? Amen. It's that simple. It's that receiving what he has done, acknowledging my sin, asking for forgiveness and saying, God, I need the hope that you provide. Not the hope that I can do it good enough. Not the hope that I'm going to get it all right but the hope that you wanted to come near to me, the hope that you wanted to forgive me, and the hope that you wanted to partner with me from this day forward into eternity for good. The promise is rock solid. Make it yours today. In the book of Hebrews, um, chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, it says, <clears throat> this is the hope we have as an anchor for our soul. Hope is an anchor. A hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, those are the keys right there. This hope, right, that I've taken hold of is an anchor. It doesn't move. It doesn't change. Why? Because it's in eternity. And Jesus is there forever. Right? I kind of stopped there. I cut that verse off a little before the end, but that's where I wanted to stop. Jesus has become for us a high priest for forever so that we can be with him forever. And so I'm going to close today with a reading from a song I referenced last week. And it was written by Edward Moat in 1834, and it's called Christ the Solid Rock. And I left the last stanza off intentionally um, because it talks about the third part of who we are, the spirit, that eternal part of us, and that longing that we have for a hope that goes beyond us into eternity. And the, and the song starts like this. It says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking stand, sinking sand. The second stanza says, when darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil, right? That is the hope that goes beyond my time. That is the hope that goes beyond my situation, is the hope of eternity, that the hope that I have Jesus near me, his spirit living in me, yet I have a hope eternally, and that anchor holds in eternity. So the last stanza speaks of that promise, and it says, when he shall come, it's speaking about the return of Christ to get those who have called on him to be near. It says on Christ, or, uh, when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. I'd like to pray with you before we go today. Um, I want to I wanna pray just kind of, Pray and declare a passage out of the book of Philippians. You, you probably heard it. It's been floating around out there. But this has been something that has been so near to me because in, in my life, there are many times that I faced anxieties and things that went beyond me. And I just, I needed hope. I needed direction. I needed to know what to do today. You know, I can't live in heaven right now. I have to live here today. And so I cling to the hope that I have in Christ today and the things that he has given me. So it's an us together way of living. Like I'm walking with him. I'm partnering in what he's already doing. And, and I'm looking for places to create a greater capacity for him in the lives of others and to share hope. And But this passage in Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, 
and here's what it says and so i i just declare this and pray this at the same time it says let your gentle spirit be known to all men the lord is near right oh be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to god man talk to him let him know what's going on right don't forget to put thanksgiving in there and it says this and the peace of god which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in christ jesus finally whatever is true whatever is honorable whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely Whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Right? And one translation says, as for the rest. So my prayer for you is that you would find him faithful and hope this week. Look to him. Pray. Supplication. Tell him what you need. Um, Consider the things that you have to be thankful for. Um, consider the fact that the other 996 things didn't get you this week. <laughs> I, I don't say that lightly, but that is just the reality of so many things we forget about. We forget to be thankful when the one thing is right in front of us. And as you do, the promise is that the peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will come and guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Call on him while he is near, it says. Um, invite him to be near to you today, near to you tomorrow, and near to you next week and into forever. God bless. Thanks for being with us.